This librarian and an eighth grade class from a school in Fresno read this book, The Outsiders, and on a whim wrote a letter to Francis Ford Coppola and said, we think you should make this film. And they told me that The Outsiders, a book I'd never heard of, was one of their favorite books and asked me if I would consider to make it. And it was signed by every kid in the class. And I was so touched to get a letter signed by, you know, 30 kids with their little handwriting. So clearly, you know, 13-year-olds that I, I said, well, I have to read this book because they asked me to. And I pretty much have a rule to do anything that kids ask me to do. And I read the book and I remember thinking, well, definitely, we should do this. The first time I met Francis, I was really nervous about it. It was at a big casting call for the Outsiders here in Tulsa. So I went down there, and as I was walking down the hallway toward him, I saw him waiting for me, and I realized he was a little nervous, too. And when I went up to him, I said, Mr. Coppola, I've got a really big problem with you doing this movie. And he got kind of defensive, and he said, what is that? I said, well, The Godfather was better than the book, and The Black Stallion was better than the book. Are you going to let that happen to me? And he just laughed, and we got along great ever since. Francis got an old school that we set up our production offices in. It had like a little theater at one end, and then it had a shop at the other end. And Francis' office was in a school room. It was really good because you bring all your equipment, all your trucks from uh, Los Angeles, and you uh, you create a movie studio. Johnny, come on, Johnny, don't die. Francis likes to do a lot of rehearsals, and I remember we did a lot of uh, a lot of improvisation, a lot of ad lib, and he was working with uh, video and shooting scenes from the film on video. If you're tough like me, nothing can touch you. Nothing. We went out on the streets of Tulsa and go to you know a drugstore, and we'd shoplift, and we'd do all this stuff, and we'd get in trouble. And Francis was there the whole time filming it. The fuzz won't be looking for you here. Videotape was a very new thing. He had a computerized bus that he and his son, Giancarlo, were able to edit on the fly all the scenes that we were shooting. And essentially, we went oh, about three or four weeks ahead of schedule to Tulsa and went to all the locations that we would be filming on, and we shot the film on videotape. Francis had us do a lot of really, really interesting things. Among them was sleeping in the Curtis house, which was, you know, not in a, a great part of the neighborhood, and I don't remember it having heat. Um, he wanted us to cook a meal together, and I don't cook. I don't, Tommy Howell doesn't cook, and Swayze doesn't cook, so that was a disaster. And he and Susie Hinton sat on that couch, and we were in character for hours and hours and hours on end. And finally, we were sort of looking at each other, the actors going, is this ever going to end? And I think it finally ended when Swayze pulled out the guitar and we started doing Bruce Springsteen songs. I think at that point, Francis had enough. Little bro was two-timing me again when I was in jail, man. Francis was eager for me to spend the night in jail, which I wasn't, of course, so interested in doing. But like, yeah, you know, maybe Dallas, because he's, he's been in the reformatory. You should go spend the night in jail. I was like, okay, Francis, why don't you go spend the night in jail? He would get down in the dirt with us and get dirty and lay down and say, this is how I want you to lay. And he'd lay there for a while. Rehearsals and working scenes and discussing things was, was very much a part of of the outsiders. I mean, I spent time in character, sleeping out at night in the cold, wrapped in newspaper. Apart from just being blown away from the technical aspect of, of us working in front of what was called the blue screen at that time, and walking on a piece of blue tarp that would then turn into a park or wherever we were, the best part that came out of that was the fact that we were able to draw upon personal experiences with each other as actors. And then when we would refer to moments on film, we could recall that experience for real. Francis taught me the technique of building a character with props, with wardrobe, with body language. I believe you should work very sensually with actors. Actors like it in the early stages of rehearsal. Usually I have a whole table full of props because uh, they just want to go up and get something and hold it while they're talking. And then I say, we'll go out and uh, buy a coat, you know, or rent a coat or something. And I find that, uh, that as they begin to have some real tangible stuff, they start changing and you start seeing an angle. And then when you see it, if you like it, you encourage it. 
Oh, the fire is on. Everyone watch out. The kids are in there. Action. Over here. Look at me, guys. All oh, the fire. The whole church is going to break down. Watch out. Here it comes. Oh. Is Once upon a time, there was a ladybug. His direction was always on the outside of what he actually wanted you to do. He'd say, this is one of those scenes where you're nervous, so it's like you really have to go to the bathroom. You'd go, go to the bathroom. I get it. I expected that in every film I've ever done. And often the case is basically you meet the actor on the day, you bang out the scene, he's out of there, and you know, you're know off location, and you're basically making it up as, the, as they're lighting it. Uh, the Outsiders was not like that. I mean, it was we were all grouped together, sort of, you know, in the rehearsal process, ready to put on the show. There would be scheduled sort of gaming and, and uh, comp competition between the Soches and, and the Greasers. Every weekend we would have these rival uh, matches, be it football, soccer, basketball. There was a lot of competition. We wouldn't dare compete for Francis' attention. I mean, he, honestly, Francis was untouchable. But amongst ourselves... And I remember one afternoon we were going to play a flag football match. The doorbell rang and, and somebody was standing there with some brand new sweats, drawstring gray sweats with canvas converse and a t-shirt that said greasers on it. And they handed me a really lovely plastic binder for my script. And it had the outsiders and my name on it. And I thought that's fantastic. So we all scramble off to the park and, and we go up and we've got our gray sweats and our t-shirts on and we look over and here come the gang of socias all in their beautifully colored button-down snap sweat jumpsuits and their leather high-top sneakers and their leather-bound script covers with their names on them. And I remember that just eating at us and we kicked the holy hell out of them that day. Yeah, how? All right! Woo! It was great. That's what you want from young bucks. I think all the guys that were in the gang we're staying on one floor, the greasers, right? They were in the rooms on the 18th floor. We were down the rooms on the fourth floor. Me being a social, him being a greaser, can relate to this very much so because the, the greasers got less per diem than the socials and got better, and the, the, uh, the socials got better hotel rooms. That's hardly the case. <laughs> yeah, right, right. okay. But it was exactly like that, and he's a young boy and he's still learning. We used to have rumbles in the hotel lobby of the hotel, and there was a, a fountain in the hotel. There was one time we had a huge rumble where people were being thrown in the fountain and stuff like that. It was, it was very classic. But it was good, it was healthy. It was very healthy to exercise <laughs> yeah. that ability. See, Leif Garrett, good friends today. Really, I love this kid. <laughs> There were times when it got almost a little over the top. Like it was like, hey, whoa, you know, you guys, you guys really are actors. You, know, you don't hate each other. We spent like three nights shooting that scene and I got deathly ill. But it wasn't the actual dunking that was rough. It was building up to it. I mean, there, there was some grabbing and some, a bit of a fight going on and struggling. And Francis didn't want it to look easy. He wanted us to look like we were getting away. And, and I didn't make it easy on Leif, you know? I mean, I tried very hard and, and, and Francis came up to me and said, do not let him put you in that water, period. My struggling consisted of a few blows to Leif here and there, but they got me in. And uh, in the long run, you know, they dunked me pretty good and Leif, Leif got even with me. We knew that we had a lot of nights. We knew it was going to be very cold. We have this scene where we have a fight. Now, I'd like to say a few words about the rumble tonight. What's going on? <laughs> we started out shooting the fight by the campfire. Francis chose a campfire because it could keep the kids warm. Halfway through the evening, it started to rain. So you had two choices. You either quit filming, or you pretend like there's been a clap of lightning and thunder and there's been this huge apocalyptic thing happening and the fight begins. So that's exactly what Francis did, was that he just put in a flash of lightning and thunder on the track at the first punch, and then you had, you had all the rain. The rain for a while, and then we had to go to extra rain that we had from Rain Tower. 
these poor kids, it was so cold. When we would turn off the rain machines, you could just see the steam coming off of Tom and Patrick and all those kids. We had this scene where the church is burning down, and one of the shots is a beam falls on the back of Ralph Macchio. And you really can't put a flaming beam onto an actor because it's gonna hurt them. So there is a theatrical trick that's called Pepper's Ghost, which is a 45 degree angle piece of glass that will reflect an element on one side and you can shoot through the glass so it looks like it's superimposed on the glass. So we had these two beams that came down. One was black that actually hit Ralph. The other one was a beam that had flames on it. And when it came down, it looked as though there was a burning beam actually hitting him, and he was perfectly safe. Because sunsets only last a very, very short time, we shot a long shot of the boys walking up the hill and staying in position and then uh, walking off the hill. Golly, that was sure pretty, huh? We had a second camera. Yeah that shot the sunset at the same time. It's like the mist is what's pretty, you know, or gold and silver. Then we took that film and we had a big building at the fairgrounds in Tulsa and we projected it on a screen behind them and we put them in front of it. And then that barbed wire stuff we had in the foreground too, so it ties the two locations together so you feel like you're in the same place. And it's impossible to shoot a scene this long with all this coverage if you uh, don't do it this way because the sunset is just too short. It looks more like what I would consider to be a 50s cinemascope picture like Rebel Without a Cause or East of Eden or something like that. You're trying to do a stylistic thing that's evocative of movies of that time, but against a realistic background, so you have those two things kind of contrasting each other. Francis wanted this to be a big epic picture, so we did it in the anamorphic format, which is known as cinemascope, or sometimes as panavision, as soon as you which get means it's one. roughly two and a half times wider than it is tall. It gives you a lot of compositional space. And then don't so much as stick your nose at the door. Am I clear? And it's very, very good for situations when you're in a lot of small rooms. We had an ensemble cast. You want the cast together. You want them playing the scene together. You don't want a lot of cuts. There are several shots where we wanted to carry the focus all the way across the frame. There's the sequence in the burn ward. It was in a real hospital. The room we had was physically very, very small. This is one of those situations where you go, holy smoke, you want to see everybody's face, but you have one person who's face down, these other two people standing over the top of them. You know that you've got to see Ralph's face, you've got to see Ralph looking at them, you've got to see the kids looking at him, and you have to see what his physical condition is. That's your picture in the paper here for uh, being here. And I realized that the best angle would be this low angle. And this is where Cinemascope was just fabulous because you could put Ralph in the foreground and then you had this kind of like wire form of pipes around and in those holes in the pipes you could compositionally put the other people in. Stay cool. There are several shots where we wanted to carry the focus all the way across the frame where you would have a close up in one side of the frame and kind of a long shot in the other. What happened to other guys? Huh? After uh, the socia has been killed at the fountain, you see all of Ralph Macchio's coverage, and you see him sharp, but we also wanted to see the body sharp, like the body is always haunting him. Well, the only way that you can do that is to put uh, what is called a split field diopter, and it's, it's just like bifocals, only the bifocal is turned vertically. Hey, Gold. I feel like I really owe my career to that project on a big level. I'm amazed at how many people have recognized the work and the cast and the story and the, the quality that came out of that.
I've been working for Francis for 24 years, and in that time, I've opened up a lot of mail. I'm holding here in my lap a stack of hundreds of letters that Francis Coppola has received since 1983, when The Outsiders first came out. It's really unprecedented in filmmaking that you would have this continual response after so many years of asking the same question, that people love the film, but they wish it was a little more like the book. The film had had a very elaborate introduction of all the characters that introduces the boys and also sets up the conflict between the greasers and the Soches by virtue of the way that Soches brutalize Pony Boy, who is a young kid brother. Pull a blade on you? Then I thought, with the pressure I was getting from Warner Brothers to try to make the film more effective with the audience, I thought maybe uh, instead of doing that, I could just cut that off and get right to the introduction of Dallas and the boys and start the movie with them walking through town and give up that elaborate introduction. And uh, that's what I did. The force of these letters really started having an effect on Francis and thinking why couldn't he put the scenes back that were shot but never included in the film. I got a letter from Francis explaining that they, you know, did some work on the film, uh, you know, plugged in a lot of the scenes that were missing, more the complete novel. And he said I would, were trying to pull together to bring the cast up to Napa and view the new cut version of The Outsiders. We were picked up in, in Los Angeles in a private jet. It was a trip. It felt like yesterday and 20 years ago at the same time. We haven't changed the day. Yes, aren't we just as young as we are? Don't. <laughs> Francis explained that he runs into people all the time that would say, what happened to this scene? And this was one of my favorite scenes in the book. And ironically, I had that all the time as well. But this is where we did the actors. We sit and we have little lunches. And this is what I always wanted. No pressure, right. no money. Well, it only was made possible because I got lucky with the, the, the resorts and the wine company. Otherwise, I'd be doing What's going on movies. with the resorts? What? They're very successful. Yeah. I'd be doing movies of the week, you know, uh, uh, for... Uh, like me. Jobs. Don't say it like that. <laughs> I treated him like I treated everybody else with, with, you know, at the time was a bit sort of cocky and sassy and, and honest, you know. <laughs> and someone's got to do them. And we can't all be friends. It's for Coppola. <laughs> yeah, we can all, we can all oh have a here. I wasn't uh, intimidated by his work because I didn't know of his work, and I I know he liked that a lot. Wow, this was your car. What happened to it? It's been it hasn't been maintained. We went out for the little nostalgic walk and and wound up uh, discovering the Mustang that uh, is the Socha's Mustang in the in uh, the film. They were the outsider cars. It was a trip. I mean, it's 20 years later. What did they do? It's been attacked. Look at this car. I mean, what 17-year-old Brad is allowed to drive this car? I have been maintained better than this car. <laughs> There's no doubt well, about hello. that. Well, hello. It goes without saying with Francis. You have, it has to end with a, a, a great meal and everybody, you know, getting together, drinking wine, and talking about the old days and just enjoying just some human time. We did that every Friday uh, when we shot. <laughs> You guys hungry, you think? What I'm after is for everyone to feel so comfortable in such a relaxed mood that they'll throw out things that they might withhold. Drinking great wine, getting to resurrect old friendships. Eating strawberries. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody told a, a, a crew member looked at foods for the talent. And then, was Ron and then Leif the went over to the table and Ralph said, hey Leif, that's for the talent. And that's oh, when they I remember snapped this. the photo. That's what the poster is. Oh my lord, I remember that. He said, he said, leave that food, it's for the talent. And that's my favorite in the movie. I love what he, he's just so out there. He went for it, didn't he? I get you a hangout, a hideout, a hangout. That means, yeah, that was <laughs> reaching for the I find next you line. a teepee, a tent, <laughs> a, a, tent. A, a fort. I got you a fort. Do you have any idea probably how most of us that were in that movie how long we waited to find anybody that came, you, you screwed us all up. Okay. How long we waited to find anybody that came anywhere close to you. For, after you, everybody in my life was a bozo. Really? The main thing of directing is you're sort of like the ringmaster. 
and you try to lay out all, you know, maybe you put the strawberries there because maybe, you know, like that famous scene in, I, I was telling them today, the famous scene in The Godfather where Marlon is there with the cat. Mm -hmm. yeah. The cat was the <coughs> studio cat. I just picked it up and put it in his hand on the second take. Mm -hmm. So you're like just constantly offering yeah. options. Here we are. And, and we went and we watched the film. Hey, everybody. Let's sit in that chair. Oh, wow. The socias. Well, at least we got the front. Forever greaser. Right. So, so you're gonna see the new cut of the movie. Basically, the new cut is like the long cut. And what's that thing on Pony Boy's neck? It's the question I always got when they cut out. Oh, the because well, now they're gonna know. Now they're gonna know. They're gonna, know. They're gonna see. So, that knife so uh, originally the concept was it was a kind of a kid's Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. So my dad correctly wrote a kind of Gone with the Wind score, but I always felt somehow that it was a barrier. It's a bit epic. Yeah, that the the movie they were like, you know, intimate with one another mm. and. And I said, well, maybe it should be more the music that they listen to rather than right. the music that is imposed as a Hollywood score. The biggest shock was the way the movie opened because the whole first reel, when I in out. essence, was not there. Wait a minute, is that Elvis? This is, all, this is all new stuff, man. From the darkness of the movie house, I had only two things on my mind. It's nice to have those questions answered. Specifically from a selfish Johnny point of view, you learn a little bit why he doesn't go home and what's happening at his house. Just in little snippets. Going home, Johnny Cake. He basically has no place to go and he just kicks a can. I don't know. And then just, you know, looking for a place to belong. It's a lot of work that, that I did as a very young actor, very inexperienced so many years ago, and the great body of my work was cut out of the movie. So I was left for years wondering why. Pull a blade on you? And it was really great to see it, and to see that the scenes work. It ain't gonna hurt you no more. And that the performances are all strong. I really liked what I saw, and, and so it's been a great sense of relief. I work in the morning. The long sequence between Pony Boy and his brother Soda Pop in bed for quite a long time, uh, talking as brothers would do. You know, they were both really attractive boys, and we, you know, there would be some snickers occasionally of this long scene. Rob Lowe, especially, was a very, very handsome, uh, if, if not an androgynous kind of look. Called Pony. Little. And they're all walking around in this movie in their underwear, which was part of what boys living together would be. And we reacted, as sometimes you do when you're in a preview situation, well, let's just cut the stuff out. Terry yells at you like that. You don't mean nothing. Just... I find it really moving. I don't know if it's because I'm a father now, and I have two sons of my own, but when I, when I watch the scene, it's very emotional and moving for me. Sure. Sort of a running gag between the rest of us and, and Rob, because a lot of Rob's stuff got cut out, you know? And, and obviously, it wasn't because Rob was a bad actor or anything, but we used to tease him about that. But there's a particular scene at the park where Rob's character, Soda Pop, sort of breaks down and he runs off. And, we tackle him in the park and there's these three brothers, the Curtis brothers, who kind of break down together and, and listen to what Rob has to say about who we are and what we're trying to do as a family. And that scene got cut out. It was really a moving scene and, and it just kind of made sense to have his character have a voice about what we were going through and that was missing in the film, yet it was so prominent in the book. It was amazing to see those new scenes because so much of the story of the brothers was lost in the original movie. And I really always thought that the, the Outsiders, at its core, was a story about brothers. To see that back, it's truer to what we did. He meant your gold when you were a kid, like green. When you were a kid, everything's new. Dawn. Ralph, you killed that. Oh, killed that. That was just unbelievable, man. It was a, a nostalgic ride, you know. I feel I'm going to have to jump you after this. <laughs>
the beginning and the end of the film, the, the explanation, the balance of the bookends uh, really helps all the characters. I remember moments that I shared with Diane Lane after seeing the movie that um, I never really remembered before. She would recall things that I'd said to her and, and of course I would deny them because, you know, at 14 I had the biggest crush you could have on, on a young girl and I never wanted her to know that, but I'm sure she did. It's really quite wonderful because the reason for making the film in the first place was a letter from young people. And now these letters over the last 23 years have added up to another version of the film. My granddaughter, Giancarla, uh, invited me once to, to her school where the kids had read the book and I brought a version, it wasn't really out, but I brought the version that I had reconstructed with everything put back because uh, I wanted them to see as it was when it really told the entire story as the novel does. And that's partly the impetus for my wanting to show it that way now. You know, I was crazy, you know that kid? I was crazy about wanting Johnny to stay out of trouble, man. If he was smart like me, he wouldn't have been in this mess. If he was smart like me, he wouldn't have ran in that church, man. The Outsiders is a story about teenage have-nots and of gangs and of violence. It is a world where there are no adults and kids make it by their own rules. Since its publication in 1967, The Outsiders has sold over four million copies in the United States and has been translated into seven other languages. Its author, Susie Hinton, who writes under the name S.E. Hinton, has become one of the most successful authors for young people. How her book came to be made into a film began here three years ago in the vineyards of Fresno, California at Lone Star School. There is a reminder of those origins of the road to Hollywood on the bulletin board in the library where Joellen Masakian holds forth as librarian as she did three years ago. <laughs> Next question. Some of the students who took part in that project Return to the school this weekend at our request, along with two of the actors from the film, Patrick Swayze and C. Thomas Howell. What happened was, Mrs. Masakian sent director Francis Ford Coppola a letter, along with a petition signed by the class suggesting the outsiders be made into a movie. I asked Mrs. Masakian, why Coppola? I picked up a review of The Black Stallion about the time I was deciding, trying to decide where this was going to go. And I had read he'd done such a good job on that. I thought we'd get an answer, but I thought it'd be just a nice letter. I'd dutifully mount on construction paper mm -hmm. and uh, mount and put on the library, and that'd be it. I didn't dream that it would go this far. Never heard of The Outsiders. I was, in fact, surprised to hear that a, a real favorite of high school age or junior high school age kids was just unknown to me. But then again, I had never heard of The Black Stallion. Uh, when we started that project uh, and, and it turned out that that was a real kids favorite and so it was clear that there was a whole area of young people's fiction that just had not come my way and and was not really uh, uh, was not really explored by the people making films because these were bestseller books that had had uh, been around for 20 years and no one had ever bought them the young people who signed that petition are now high school sophomores and juniors but remember vividly what first impressed them about reading The Outsiders. For one, it began with her teacher's reaction. She read us the book, Mrs. D, Miss D, and when she read it, she cried. And she was an adult, and she's usually all stately up there, not too emotional. But to see her cry like that, that grabbed my interest more than anything. I could relate to them fully. Why? Because they were, they were today, even though it was written, I don't know how many years ago it was written, but they were still around. Those same characters that lived in the book were living today, and I saw them in my friends and everywhere I went. The session between the students and the two actors was also an opportunity for one of them to remember whom to thank. You know, and, and just put out what we felt because you know what I put out was what I really felt is uh, my career wouldn't be where where it is now it, unless it was uh, unless you guys had had done what you did and sent the peti petition and the book and everything to Francis you know so in a way I thank you 
On the wall of the school library, amidst all of the other outsiders' memorabilia, is a plaque dedicated to Joe Allen Masaki and, and the students of Lone Star School. It represents more than a librarian's dream, because when it opened last weekend in more than 850 theaters, the box office returns were so promising that an ad was taken out in a Hollywood trade paper. For Francis Coppola's Zoetrope Studio, those are encouraging numbers. His most recent film, One from the Heart, has Coppola struggling to keep his studio off the auction block. Wouldn't it be ironic if this relatively inexpensive little film, which came to Francis Coppola's attention from a group of students at Lone Star School, turned out to be the saving grace of Zoetrope Studios? For today, Jim Brown, NBC News, Fresno, California. Soda is handsomer than anyone else I know. Not like dairy. Soda's movie star, kind of handsome. The kind that people stop on the street to watch go by. He's not as tall as dairy, and he's a little slimmer. But he has a finely drawn, sensitive face that somehow manages to be reckless and thoughtful at the same time. He's got gold dark hair that he combs back, long, silky, and straight. And in the summer, the sun bleaches it to a shining wheat gold. His eyes are dark, lively and dancing, recklessly laughing eyes that can be gentle and sympathetic at one moment and blazing with anger the next. He has dad's eyes. But so does one of a kind. He can get drunk in a drag race or dancing without ever getting near alcohol. In our neighborhood, it's rare to find a kid who doesn't drink once in a while. But Soda never touches a drop. He doesn't need to. He gets drunk on just plain living. And he understands everybody. He looked at me more closely. I looked away hurriedly, because if you want to know the truth, I was starting to bawl. I knew I was as white as I felt, and I was shaking like a leaf. Soda just put his hand on my shoulder. Easy pony boy. They ain't gonna hurt you no more. Derry is six feet two and broad-shouldered and muscular. He has dark brown hair that kicks out in front and a slight cow lick in the back, just like Dad's. But Derry's eyes are his own. He's got eyes that are like two pieces of pale blue-green ice. They've got a determined set to them like the rest of him. He looks older than 20, tough, cool, and smart. He would be real handsome if, if his eyes weren't so cold. He doesn't understand anything that is not plain hard fact, but he uses his head. I'm gonna read a little description here of uh, Dallas. And it's kind of funny because it's really so different physically from me. If I had to pick the real character of the gang, it would be Dallas Winston, Dally. I used to like to draw his picture when he was in a dangerous mood but then I could get his personality down in a few lines. He had an elfish face with high cheekbones and a pointed chin, small sharp animal teeth and ears like a lynx. His hair was almost white, it was so blonde, and he didn't like haircuts or hair oil either. So it fell over his forehead in wisps and kicked out in the back in tufts and curled behind his ears and along the nape of his neck. His eyes were blue, blazing ice, cold with hatred of the whole world. Dally had spent three years on the wild side of New York and had been arrested at the age of 10. He was tougher than the rest of us, tougher, colder, meaner. The shade of difference that separates a greaser from a hood wasn't present in Dally. He was as wild as the boys in the downtown outfits, like Tim Shepard's gang. Finally, between sobs, Johnny managed to gasp out his story. He had been hunting our football to practice a few kicks when a blue Mustang had pulled up beside the lot. There were four Soches in it. They had caught him, and one of them had a lot of rings on his hands. That's what had cut Johnny up so badly. It wasn't just that they had beaten him half to death. He could take that. They had scared him. They had threatened him with everything under the sun. Johnny was high-strung anyway, a nervous wreck from getting belted every time he turned around and from hearing his parents fight all the time. Living in those conditions might have turned someone else rebellious and bitter. It was killing Johnny. He had never been a coward. He was a good man in a rumble. He stuck up for the gang and kept his mouth shut, good around cops. But after the night of the beating, Johnny was jumpier than ever. I didn't think he'd ever get over it. Johnny never walked by himself after that. 
and Johnny, who was the most law-abiding of us, now carried in his back pocket a six-inch switchblade. He'd use it, too, if he ever got jumped again. They had scared him that much. He would kill the next person who jumped him. Nobody was ever going to beat him like that again. Not over his dead body. We all had the money to get in. It only costs a quarter if you're not in a car. But Dally hated to do things the legal way. He liked to show that he didn't care whether there was a law or not. He went around trying to break the law. We went to the rows of the seats in front of the concession stand to sit down. Nobody else was there except two girls who were sitting down front. Dally eyed them coolly and then walked down the aisle and sat right behind them. I had a sick feeling that Dally was up to his usual tricks and I was right. He started talking loud enough for the two girls to hear. He started out bad and then he got worse. Dallas could talk awful dirty if he wanted to. And I guess he wanted to then. I felt my ears get hot. Two bitter Steve or even Soda would have gone right along with him just to see if they could embarrass the girls, but those kind of kicks just don't appeal to me. I sat there, struck dumb, and Johnny left hastily to get a Coke. Hey, what do you know? Bob said a little unsteadily. Here's the little greasers that picked up our girls. Hey, greasers, you're out of your territory. Johnny warned in a low voice, you'd better watch it. Randy swore at us, and they stepped even closer. Bob was eyeing Johnny. Nup, pal, you're the ones who better watch it. Next time you want a broad, pick up your own kind. Dirt. I was getting mad. I was hating them enough to lose my head. You know what a greaser is, Bob asked? White trash with long hair. I felt the blood draining from my face. I've been cussed out and sworn at, but nothing ever hit me like that did. Johnny Cake made a kind of gasp, and his eyes were smoldering. You know what a soch is, I said. My voice was shaking with rage. White trash with mustangs and madras. And then, because I couldn't think of anything bad enough to call them, I spit at them. Bob shook his head, smiling slowly. You could use a bath, greaser. And a good working over, and we've got all night to do it. I wouldn't have felt so embarrassed if they'd been greasy girls. I might even have helped old Dallas. But those two girls weren't our kind. They were tough-looking girls, dressed sharp and really good-looking. They looked about 16 or 17. One had short, dark hair, and the other had long, red hair. The redhead was getting mad, or scared. She sat up straight, and she was chewing hard on her gum. And the other one pretended not to hear Dally. And Dally was getting impatient. He put his feet up on the back of the redhead's chair, winked at me, and beat his own record for saying something dirty. She turned around and gave him a cool stare. <laughs> I wanted to chew gum in that scene, but he wouldn't let me. I'm Essie Hinton, but you can call me Susie. I'm here at the Admiral Twin Drive-In. This is a theater where I went often as a kid, and when I was writing The Outsiders, I used this location for an incident in the book. Bring me a coat! I don't have enough money! This is the area where we set up with chairs like it was in my day when I was a teenager. Usually the kids that sat in front of the concession stand were the kids that walked in and paid a quarter. So you normally didn't see girls like Cherry and Marcia sitting out here. But I was out here one evening and I saw girls having a fight with their boyfriends, get out of the car and, and sit over in the chairs in kind of a mad huff. And that inspired the incident that I later wrote into the book and then later we shot here at the movies. You sure you wanna do this? I came here to see a movie and I'm gonna see a movie. Diane was absolutely picture perfect for Cherry. She and Matt had this funny little flirtation, irritation, flirtation, irritation thing going with each other, very much like Dallas and Cherry Valance did in the book. I didn't know you had this problem with yelling in my face. The night we shot here <laughs> was freezing cold, and when Tommy says, no, 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 man, I'm freezing, freezing, he really meant it. Why didn't you bring a coat, stupid? I got it. 
One of the funny incidents that happened that night when Dallas falls out of his chair trying to put the make on Sherry it wasn't supposed to happen. That was not rehearsed. In fact, if you look, you can see Tommy Howe look at Francis, expecting him to say cut, while they all laugh. But Matt climbed up like the trooper and went on with the shot. What a clown. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I said you're a clown. <laughs> Shut up. Every once in a while, it still plays at this theater, and you can see from the highway. And one time, I was driving down the highway, and I looked over, and there was the Outsiders playing in it was the drive-in scene, and that was a layer on layer on layer of weird. Here we are at Will Rogers High School. This is where I went to high school. This is where I first became extremely aware of all the groups, the socias and the greasers. I wrote The Outsiders while I was a junior here. I wrote it for a lot of reasons. The first was I just liked to write. I loved to read and I wrote it because I was mad about the social situation of everybody getting into their little groups and staying in their little groups and not having friends outside their groups. So I took the two extremes to write about the greasers and the socias. When I was in high school, I saw a lot of rough things going on. There was none of this in the literature at that time. So The Outsiders is usually credited with starting the trend toward realistic young adult fiction. My job in The Outsiders of Film, well, I was a greaser den mother. The boys were here with no adult supervision, and so I tried to look after them. Francis would ask me to look over the dialogue and cut it as needed. And it was really fascinating because he took the book and he outlined the thought in one color, the action in one color, and the dialogue in one color, and kind of just chopped the book up into pieces like that. And from there wrote the screenplay. There's very little I didn't do on The Outsiders, including getting a little part where I played the nurse that was being hassled by Dallas, which by then being hassled by Matt was so comfortable. What's happened to your gown? I threw it away. I'm going to be so get mad out. when Just you're Just get out. You're making, me, making my stomach Thank sick. <laughs> Francis came here, and while he was here, he said, well, would you drive me around and show me places that you were thinking about when you wrote the book? So I took him to the Admiral Twin Drive-In and my high school, Will Rogers High School, and neighborhoods like I was thinking about. And he said, no, this is great, I'll shoot here. We're here at the Curtis house. This is where the Curtis brothers lived in the movie. One day, Francis said, Susie, we found the Curtis house, do you want to see it? And I said, sure, he said, well, I'll take you there on my bike. And I thought he meant a motorcycle, but we get out there and he had a big old fat tired bicycle, which he put 60 pounds of camera equipment in the basket, got me on the bar and pedaled me over to this house. And of course, we were falling all over the place, but it was a fun ride, and that was my introduction to the house. It was here that we introduced the characters one by one. And I think this opening gives us a lot more background about who these people are and what happens later at the drive-in. Hey, who's looking for police trouble, man? I just want to go see a movie like the good old days, right, Johnny? The boys were so much fun. They really had a good bonding experience. They ain't gonna hurt me no more. Soda and Pony were very close in the book, and actually the actors, Rob and Tommy, were very close during the movie shoot, too. And Patrick got into bossing them around, and they got a little resentful of that, just like in the book. on something else just once in a while. One of the fun scenes shot from this house was the night of the rumble when the boys were doing acrobatics and jumping around. Tom Cruise was determined to do his acrobatic stunt. He and Patrick had been practicing. But the night of the shoot, Tom came to me and said, Susie, I really ate too much at lunch and I don't feel well and I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. And I said, well, Tom, would you feel better if you threw up? And he said, you know, I think I would. So I took him over to the catering truck and made him drink raw eggs until he threw up. And then he felt much better and did the stunt perfectly. We all knew he was going to be a star. He really got into it, took the cap off his tooth. Makes me look kind of, kind of tough. Beefed himself up and really got into the fights. What do you mean none of my business? It is my business. Look at my nose. This is the street where Dallas died, where he was shot down by the policeman. That was a rough night shoot because Matt had the little gunshot squibs taped to his bare skin since he left the hospital with just a jacket on. 
and when those squibs went off, it hurt. I think Matt did a great job as Dallas. I actually recommended him to Francis. Matt and I had worked together on my movie Tex, and I was very impressed with his acting ability. He really has that little swagger that Dallas was supposed to have. It's just been amazing to me how this book keeps speaking to each new generation, because now parents are giving their children the book and saying, I really liked this when I was a kid, I bet you will too. Outsider readings, first is Ralph Macchio as Johnny. Vincent Spano, Juan Derry. Cut right away. Right Helen Slater, 5 feet 8 inches, 18 years old. Kate Capshaw. Is that nice? I'm 5'7 and a hint. <laughs> My name's Adam Baldwin. What's your age range? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm 1920 in February. I'd say 20, 21 to 30. What do you think? I went to film school at UCLA a long time ago. After coming out of the Army, where I was drafted and was in the Army for two years, my first job was in the mailroom at MCA. It was the first place I could get my foot in the door in the business. In casting, I had total confidence in my eye and my judgment and taste. The first kind of breakthrough movie in casting for me was a movie called Petulia, directed by Richard Lester. And the movie got a great reputation for its cast and casting. Work just flowed to me after that. I've known Francis since the beginning of uh, the pre-production and uh, casting of The Godfather. He, uh, he would just call me up out of the blue and schmooze about actors. We worked in a very give and take way, either free to make suggestions. Francis uh, got this job. He says, hey, I'm doing this uh, movie, kind of a big time movie. Uh, you want to cast it with me and for me? And I said, sure, of course. And uh, he says, well, get on over here and let's start. American Graffiti uh, came shortly after The Godfather. That was another great, great experience of casting. The Outsiders came maybe uh, 10 years after American Graffiti. They were kind of similar missions to put together a group of young actors. I always like to think that my actors that I put in a movie are going to become stars and be heard of again. Francis was always trying to change the, the usual methods of casting and doing things in the movies. Francis being Francis, he never plays by anybody's rules. Well, I've always experimented with how you do casting. Oh, let's have music. The traditional way of uh, testing actors is you have kind of a room, and the actors wait in an outer office, get nervous as can be. There's a lot of tension, and uh, you don't know if you get the best out of kids, particularly. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's OK. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. So kind of play it, let's try it again from the top, try to play it that the guys know. So Francis decided to bring all the testing actors in at the same time and have like an all day testing thing. And we stomped those socials good. In a sound stage. Anytime here. Uh, t uh, t um... Yeah, again. It was sort of the film that everybody wanted to be cast in. We walked into the studio, and every actor under the age of 35, I mean everyone, was lined up on the floor sitting against the wall, and Francis was running the auditions. And I'll never forget it. He had one of the first um, tape cameras that anybody had ever seen, and he was playing opera. The audition process, which is sort of infamous, or famous now, how it was done, all actors were brought into a sound stage. Take your feet off my chair and shut your trap. And every actor was grouped 
in different groups, playing different parts, um, watching the other actors do their takes. Francis was sort of orchestrating, or he had people helping him uh, put groups together, and you ran scenes. I know you two, don't I? Y'all uh, y'all hang around rodeos. When they weren't actually being shot, they were sitting just off stage watching the others. Now, that is, that no actor had ever been through that kind of experience. Here, they just invited everybody into this big room, and we all sat and basically waited, and Francis would just point and call out names and say, now you're playing this role. Don't slam the door. So it became like, like gladiator. And Francis would go, um, all right, I want Mickey Rourke and uh, Val Kilmer and Rob Lowe. And then he'd go, okay, Rob, you go sit down, and uh, all right, now I want Tom Cruise and uh, Dennis Quaid and Scott Bayo. And it was a complete free-for-all. And begin. Yeah, take it easy. I got plenty of money here. To this day, I think auditioning for The Outsiders was probably one of the most grueling processes that I've been through as an actor. I'm sorry, this isn't working. I don't know why. <sighs> I've never heard of an audition process since that was like the outsiders. Kill them with switchblades too, don't you, pony boy? Every actor got to try for two or three different parts and got to try it as many times as he wanted, and they all be, kind of became friends, and uh, they got into the spirit of it. It became a kind of a fun, fun day and a fun thing. Now listen up. Listen up real good, because I'm going to say this once. You're going to hop the 315 freight to Windrixville. Hop the 315 freight to Windrixville. You hop the 315 freight to Windrixville. OK, what you got to do is hop the 315 train to Windrixville. I save all my uh, notes and casting lists from every movie I've ever done. So this dog-eared piece of paper goes back to February, March, 1982. And um, I can look up on um, January uh, 13th, 1982, I interviewed Rob Lowe. My notes say, uh, Excellent reading, very attractive, very winning, very preppy, 18 years old, very good looking. Jesus, you guys can't you watch? He was incredibly pretty. Pretty is even a better word than handsome for Rob. And he grew in the character and uh, through the rehearsal process that Francis put everybody through. He nailed it beautifully. Can you tell me your name? Matt Dillon. Okay. And how, how old are you, Matt? 17. I guess I'll, I'll read Dallas, I guess. Okay. I think Francis particularly uh, felt strongly about Matt from the, the earliest day of testing or even interviewing. I remember Francis coming up to me and saying, uh, you can go home now. He come, coming up to me and sending me home early. And I remember thinking, oh, you blow it, man. You didn't get the job. There's no way. And I remember uh, going and, and calling uh, my manager from Grand Central saying, I blew it. I didn't get it. I know it. And being very depressed about it. Only to find out that the reason he sent me home was because he, he knew he was going to cast me in the film. Later on, I discovered that. Of course, it was a highlight for me. All right. Here you go. Buff. You guys aren't exactly the same size, but you know, it's dry. Hey, it's, it's going to be cold where you're going. This character that Matt played had been in uh, New York City and uh, had come to Oklahoma from New York, so he had the, kind of the street smarts, the street toughness. Now, Matt is a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker. He would like to think he was, but he wasn't really a tough New York boy. He was incredibly uh, handsome. A, a kind of mean toughness, but you still like him. Are you a real redhead? When he dies, I mean, you you cared deeply that, of that loss because of Matt's performance. I'm Diane Lane. Diane Lane. Well, Diane Lane had been acting since she was, you know, six. <laughs> um, have you ever uh, been in love with somebody? Yeah. <laughs> The most important, I thought, was the first time I fell in love, or I thought I was in love. You know, she was just turning 16. It was from a kid to a real teenager. Leaving on the guy, just saying, look at me, look at me. Now, whatever you're going to do to make him look at you. I don't know. 
she was my cherry choice from the get-go. Excuse me, uh, yeah. uh, what's your first name again? Ralph. Ralph. Doing it this way is like you're starting to Ralph was, a, uh, was small. A little, uh, There's a kind of, uh, toughness and a kind of sweetness at the same time. Okay. Kids have long hair. Why do they all cut there? See if you can find the humor. No, yeah. Plus, Ralph uh, okay. had real acting chops. He was a little pro. Okay, anytime. One thing I clearly remember is anytime I was asked to read a different role, I was sort of bummed that, uh, well, maybe I won't get the Johnny part, you know, because I wanted to play. So I got to read Pony Boy. I think I read two bits once or twice, and I was too young and frail to be Dallas or anything. But I just wanted, I was specifically wanted uh, uh, to have the opportunity to play Johnny, and so, uh, so it, was, it was an exciting journey. You are living in a vacuum, Pony, and you're going to have to cut it out. I was kind of a, a fan of Patrick's. I had seen him in some cheesy movie, uh, Roller Boogie, or some roller skating dance movie. I found him very interesting, and I arranged to uh, meet him. Oh, man. He was older. He conveyed older than the other boys. I saw Sandy wanted was to give it back. In point of fact, he was a lot older, but he was able to play just the right amount of older. I never had a thing to do with her parents. Pony Boy uh, was the most difficult part to cast because uh, he tells the story. Fix breakfast. Let's start over. Okay. The first one up has to fix breakfast, and the other two do breakfast. I'll never forget seeing Tom Howell for the first time. I walked into uh, the stage, and the auditions were already happening, and Tommy was playing Pony Boy. And they sent everybody back, and Tommy stayed. And then other people played their parts, and they sent everybody back, and Tommy stayed. And then more people came up and played different parts, and Tommy stayed. And I went, that's Pony Boy. All three of us like chocolate cake for breakfast. Mom and Dad allowed it with ham, never allowed it with ham and eggs. But he had such so gravitas for a kid of his age. He has such weight. I just can't stand any of you guys fine anymore. Francis and I both knew Emilio uh, a little bit. Sometimes I just have to get out. Marty Sheen had been our star on, on Apocalypse Now and had been in the Philippines. And the kids who were out there a lot of the time. So we had known Emilio uh, from all those months in the Philippines. I think it was a great choice because uh, he, uh, he had a lot of droll humor to him. You have six every night, pal. <laughs> Rosie Palm and her five daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, we're going to be late. Tom Cruise, you could see his talent from Taps, and uh, he took um, this testing process very, very seriously and was very intense. I remember him not so much being part of the boys playing around with each other between, between tests, between takes. I think he was mooding up, getting into his character. He takes his acting very, very seriously and prepares very, very seriously. Try one that's like a seasoned gangster. A gangster, you know, like Humphrey Bogart. Take care, kid. I want to try this again. No quick. In a sense, I was only interested in, you know, the magic they were going to make there reading the scene. I didn't realize that they were all <laughs> nervous, you know, of course. You tend to want to go a little more fast. you got to learn slowness. Okay. That's why I'm playing you this little music. To me, it's all fun, and of course, to them, it was life and death career. <laughs> we had a wealth of talent to choose from there, and we just uh, made gut decisions on who we chose. Casting is, is the most fun of, of the movie-making process. The casting period, and when you make your decisions, it's all optimism. I guess we're different. So, maybe they are. I can never not get totally involved in the casting of a movie. It's just uh, in my DNA, I guess. Just checking hey. Diane's height. How tall are you? I'm 5'5". Five, 5'5". Five. Five, five. How much do you weigh? I'm 6'. Do some poetry. The 
Outsiders. Pony Boy. Dallas. Johnny. Cherry. Soda Pop. Daryl. Two Bit. Steve. Bob. Essie Hetton's classic novel comes to the screen, capturing all the intensity, all the excitement, all the emotions of youth. The Outsiders, directed by Francis Coppola. <laughs>